Hi, and uh, welcome to this installment of Frank and Mary here in Northborough, the COVID-19 edition. Uh, if you haven't seen the show before, my name is Art Bergeron. I do elder law as a day job with Myrick O'Connell. This is really about Frank and Mary uh, and their goal to stay in Northborough until they die and live in, and be buried in the backyard. That's their goal, like a lot of my clients. Um, and so I've got this great co-host, Chris Lindquist, uh, who is one of those jobs has been to find all these great guests for us. But for this show, um, um, for the first 15 minutes, um, we're talking, as we had talked last week, to a, one of the candidates for office here, because it was suggested to us, this is a really valuable way for you to be seeing them, especially, this is mostly seniors who are watching this show, who like Frank and Mary, get real confused, confused with all the computer stuff, but know how to turn on the TV. And so you may be watching this. So Chris, t tell us who we have again. Yeah, good morning, Arthur. Uh, so today we have uh, Jason Perot. Jason is uh, currently serving on the Board of Selectmen, I believe as chair, and he's running uh, again. And uh, so we're excited to have Jason here to answer some questions. And I think we'll, we'll go right into the first question, Jason. Um, please tell our viewers why you're running for the Board of Selectmen seat. And, uh, you know, give us a bit about your background, if you will. Thank you. Uh, sure. Uh I guess to start out, just a quick background. Uh, I'm originally uh, from Vermont uh, after college, uh, relocated to Massachusetts. I came south for the warmer weather. So um, family moved to uh, Northboro in 1996. At that time, we had uh, three young sons. The oldest was just about to start the elementary school. And uh, we were looking for a town based on the character of the town, the uh, reputation of the school system, and the location for me in terms of uh, commuting for job opportunities, uh, those were important considerations and Northboro fit the bill at that time. So if you've been here for, I guess that makes it about uh, just about 25 years, uh, nearly so. Uh, our kids went through the public school system here, uh, are now post-college and out of the house and employed, fortunately. And uh, they will tell you that uh, um, they felt that the Northboro school system made them very well prepared for the challenges, the academic challenges of college. So um, we're very, very happy with that result. Uh, somewhere in there, um, back in 1999, I first got involved with a ad hoc committee that the K-8 schools uh, had formed to study the school buildings. Uh, from that experience, uh, um, I kind of became familiar a bit with the, um, the impact on taxes uh, for some of the operational and uh, capital uh, investment the town was making and the concern that seniors had um, for the rising taxes uh, that were putting pressure on their fixed incomes. Uh, so in 2001, uh, the town had adopted uh, a provision to be able to create a uh, taxation assistance fund for elderly and disabled. And uh, when that was created, I volunteered for that and served for three years as chair uh, for that before moving on to the financial planning committee. Uh, served on financial planning for 10 years, seven as its chair, and uh, was a contributor to the issue of the dispute of the Algonquin Regional High School uh, state grant apportionment. Um, following that, uh, uh, stepped up to the Board of Selectmen in 2014, have served two terms there, including interesting issues such as the recreational marijuana prohibitions. So it's uh, been an eventful ride and uh, that's where I am today. And I basically like the opportunity to continue serving the town. Terrific, thank you. So number two question, Jason, what are two or three items on your list of important topics you think the town needs to address in the next three years and how would you address those topics? Uh, three topics to be addressed. Um, one issue I think would just be the financial aspect in the COVID-19 situation. We're facing pressure, uh, on the budget, um, not only this year, but probably looking forward three to five years. Um, so it's going to require some long-term planning. Um, in that respect, I would say that we are, um, in relatively good shape compared to a lot of communities because the financial policies we had put in place, uh, following the Great Recession about a decade ago, have um, helped to make our budget less vulnerable to some of the downturns we're going to experience in terms of state aid or local receipts, such as motor vehicle excise, uh, hotel and meals tax, things of that nature. Um, we've tried to construct a budget that doesn't uh, 
rely on non-recurring revenues to support recurring expenditures that the budget requires. Uh, so we have some flexibility, we have some time to maneuver um, to think about what we need to do um, and to plan for these next few years. A uh, second issue, um, again, depending on how long this circumstance persists, um, would be the services that we need to provide citizens that go beyond what they have been normally accustomed to. Um, in terms of senior citizens particularly, I think that basically speaks to um, isolation and lack of family contact. And so um, those would be things where uh, if, there, there, if there are needs, then we probably need to think about how those could be addressed, um, whether there would be socially distance outings, for example, that might uh, help to, um, uh, to, to break through that a little bit, um, or possibly um, additional transportation support if there are things like medical appointments or other kinds of uh, needs or something, and, and you have seniors who are um, not very mobile, uh, uh, then perhaps something more needs to be done in that respect. Uh, a third item, and again, it's a COVID-19 impact, is, is education. Um, as you know, uh, you have uh, many students uh, impacted uh, this past year with um, remote learning. It's put a lot of pressure on the students, a lot of pressure on the teachers, and a lot of pressure on the parents to try to cope with all of that while they're, uh, particularly the parents uh, in some respects, as they're trying to um, you know, continue through their day jobs while also um, trying to provide for the needs of their kids as they're trying to make their way through through that. So there, you know, in a, in a six month span here, we've, uh, we've turned our world around. We have very significant challenges to face and uh, it'll take a lot of thoughtful and constructive uh, uh, input to, to try to meet those challenges. Great. I bet you're happy that your kids are, are grown and, and you're not doing homeschooling. That's, that's gotta be a challenge. I, I tell you, I, I have heard stories, I have observed uh, the circumstances of some of the people uh, who are in that situation, and I, yeah. I, I don't know how I could cope with that. Yes, very challenging. So Jason, what specific skills and abilities would, uh, will you bring to the town uh, as selectmen? Uh, I, I, I think part of it is my experience, the fact that I have been involved in, in a range of town committees uh, and roles over this uh, last 20 years. Um, the experience of the two terms on the Board of Selectmen um, certainly has been helpful. And, uh, you know, it, it's always a learning experience. You're always never, you know, mm. quite completely uh, uh, prepared for everything that you face, but you try to do your best and trying to work constructively and collaboratively with your board members, with other boards, with town administration, uh, with the employees throughout the uh, municipal and school system. Um, uh, I, I think that's something that, that I've already faced. And uh, to some extent, I think I've, I've met that challenge. Um, I'm a software engineer uh, by, by training and occupation. And I, I kind of approach things in a certain analytical way. So in terms of budget and everything like that, I'm very comfortable uh, uh, handling that kind of thing. Uh, I'm not a very, not a very, uh, Photogenic person, not a very uh, good public speaker. Uh, uh, when put into those circumstances, I try to do my best. Uh, um, the best is is what it's going to have to be. <laughs> so uh, uh, that 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 would uh, that would be my statement. You know what? I'm I'm going to respectfully disagree. I think you are photogenic, and I think you are <laughs> an excellent public speaker. So, <laughs> well, thank you, Chris. It's very <laughs> generous of you. <laughs> So question four is kind of a true false, but you can expound on it. So, so true or false, Northborough's property taxes are in line with the services that the town provides residents, including high quality public education and high quality town services, such as police and fire, the library and the senior center, the uh, Department of Public Works, Youth and Family Services, and Parks and Recreation. So are, are the, the property taxes in line with those services? I, I would say true. Um, I think that, uh, you know, if you look across the Commonwealth, there are a range of communities at different points on the uh, economic demographic scale. Um, some of them are very high end, high taxes, high, high level of services. Others aren't at, at that end, they're at the opposite end and uh, in some respects maybe struggle to provide the services to their, their constituents. Northborough is somewhere in between. I think uh, we have, you know, excellent services overall. Um, the school system certainly is, is very attractive to people. Um, I think we've done an excellent job in terms of planning. And again, going 
going back over the last decade, trying to be um, conservative with our spending and to apply that spending in a very efficient way. I think a lot of the building projects that we've undertaken over the last few years have been well, very well managed and come in, generally speaking, uh, on time and under budget. Uh, from an operational standpoint, uh, when you're talking about services and municipal operations, much of what you're talking about is staffing. And in that respect, uh, I, I'd have to say that op, uh, Northborough operates with a very lean staff. Uh, we don't have a lot of extra overhead. We don't have, if anything, you would argue that we don't have enough staff um, for some of the services we're trying to provide. Uh, at the moment, uh, uh, we've had a facilities director position that's been in the plan for a number of years. We still haven't filled that. Um, that's something that we would like to see happen in order to uh, provide more expertise for managing our buildings. Um, overall, you know, I think you, as you look across the spectrum of services that we provide, I'm sure everyone would point to any one of them and say, perhaps there's something we can do better. Um, and maybe that's true, <laughs> but uh, collectively, I think the combination of services we provide, um, the fact that we're uh, operating under the proposition two and a half limit uh, uh, in terms of taxation, uh, that our building projects, when we do pursue those, those are pursued through a debt exclusion and those have to go through a town meeting approval and a ballot approval. So with those approvals, town, uh, the town is essentially saying, they approve of those projects, they approve of that spending. Um, so yes, I, I think we're at a good spot uh, relative to, to some other communities. Great. Arthur, I think you take the next question. Uh, my question, you already answered. It was your <laughs> point too, a little bit, a little bit farther on the list. And, and mm -hmm. I think it's terrific that you really thought about the fact that during this remaining COVID-19 period until uh, yeah. um, there's a vaccine, that seniors are going to be uniquely challenged because everybody else is kind of going back to work and doing what they're doing and all of that stuff because they know it really isn't going to hit them. It's really going to hit their mother or their grandparent or whatever. So, but it's great that you really thought about providing some, mm -hmm. acknowledging the uniqueness of that audience and realizing that the town probably really needs to be affirmatively for that group trying to provide some unique some some additional services because they are they are uniquely affected i think so i think it's great i you know right. i really appreciated uh, that answer i i i, I certainly think I, I think psychologically a lot of it is the social isolation aspect um you can't be with your your family members you can't see your friends that might have been a very significant uh, uh social outing on a regular basis up until now um you know certainly if if there are our seniors who are in need um, uh, and haven't been assisted, then we certainly want them to contact the senior center or the family and youth services. Those are the primary point of contacts. Those are the people who are best able to respond to any needs. Um, if anyone in the community knows of someone, a senior who, who isn't being assisted and needs to be assisted, again, please, please let the town know. I think, uh, the town has done a good job. Liz Trediak, our new uh, senior center di uh, director, is uh, doing a wonderful job um, and, and trying to, uh, to, to you know, meet all the needs that she's aware of. Uh, um, and uh, I, I think that uh, you know, we're capable of providing the assistance and services needed. Um, we just need to hear about it if those people haven't already been reached. And we've interviewed her on this show and she's really wonderful. She's wonderful. I think, I think aptly filling the, shoe, the very large shoes of Kelly Burke, who had been terrific for so many years. <clears throat> so we have run out of time. Um, we really, <laughs> okay. really appreciate, we really appreciate this input. And Chris, of course, I really appreciate the fact that you created all these great questions so that folks oh, can okay. answer them. Um, so thank you. We realize, you know, you, we've all got these day jobs, right? <clears throat> and you've got a lot to do. <laughs> so thanks for taking the time uh, to participate with us. Um, Chris, we, you know, we'll, be, we'll be taking a short break and then talking to our, our wonderful second guest, Michelle Grasso, about stress reduction in these difficult times for seniors. So thank you very much, Mr. Perot. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, Chris. Arthur, Chris, thank you both. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank, thank you. Thank you. And day. folks, we'll be right back. Thank yeah. you. Hi, and uh, welcome back to this installment of Frank and Mary here in Northrow, the COVID-19 edition. Uh, and Chris Linkus, my wonderful co-host, is back with me. And also a, uh, a wonderful guest, Michelle Grasso, uh, who has a, a wonderful company that we wanted her to talk to you about. 
because of the things that she does. One of the things that she's focusing, always has been focusing on is dealing with, um, among other things, stress and stress reduction. And, and she speaks to a lot of folks who are, who are seniors. For Frank and Mary, this has been a uniquely terrible time these last several months and continues to be because as everything else opens up, seniors realize that they are uniquely still threatened by this whole thing if the pandemic rears its head again. So we thought Michelle might really be able to provide some insight for folks in how to deal with that. And so Michelle, can you start off by just talking a little bit about the company and what the company does and, mm -hmm. and then specifically talk about you know, folks you've been dealing with who are dealing with these issues and how they might be able to help, help deal with them without stressing out and dying of a heart attack instead of dying of COVID. Mm. Mm. Sure, thank you for having me. Um, yes, so I own Synergy Wellness Center, which is out of Hudson, uh, and we have a range of services for physical, emotional, and spiritual health, uh, including yoga and meditation, mental health counseling, acupuncture, massage therapy, um, and a few other types of services for nutrition and uh, life direction coaching. And um, we've been working with a lot of seniors over this uh, past three months, um, even more so um, with uh, doing some mindfulness work and meditation. And we have um, transitioned classes to online and our chair yoga class has been very, very popular because a lot of senior centers where people may have been going for that resource have not been able to open. And um, so we've been pleased to serve seniors um, that way, as well as through our through mental health counseling, because people have been very, you know, um, anxious about and isolated and grieving things that they can't do or pe people their loved ones are not able to see. So um, it's been a privilege to be a resource to the community around this. And, um, you know, one of the things we've been hearing or many of the things are around um, the isolation and grief I mentioned, and, and we're just, you know, urging people and, uh, and trying to encourage people to ride the wave and know that this is a really normal feeling to have in a really uncertain, unprecedented time. You know, none of us have been through this before, but the experiences and, um, you know, mentality that seniors bring uh, often helps them to be more prepared maybe for something like this than, than younger folks. Um, and for them to know that the the young people in their life and the family and, and friends in their life want to hear from them and 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 hoping that they are reaching out and not um, necessarily seeing themselves as a burden um, by needing help for groceries or any other kinds of things you know when you want to sort of stay safe from the community but to know that we really they're really important to us and often probably have things to tell us that we really need to hear and that are of comfort great point a great point so so from from your perspective how have people been been dealing with this mm -hmm. and when you're living in this kind of changing time mm -hmm. you know how does that how does how do you deal how do you deal with it mm -hmm. right. well i think there are some um tangible things that we we can i think the overriding thing here is right we don't feel like we have a sense of control over what's happening and so what we've been you know suggesting to all of our clients, seniors and others, um, some really tangible things that people can do to impact their day on a day, on a, you know, on a real, real time basis. You know, some of them include things like keeping to a schedule and really encouraging you to try to get up at the same time, try to go to sleep at the same time, get dressed, um, you know, have your meals and really kind of have a routine to your day so that um, things to kind of mirror the, the way your life used to look before, uh, before March and, and to really keep to that routine um, as much as you could as, as you were before. You know, some of the activities too that people enjoy doing, um, we're encouraging folks to really make a list of those things and try to do one of those every day, uh, whether it's, you know, gardening or taking a walk or reading a book or, um, you know, listening to music, whatever it is that brings you joy, uh, is to really that sense of, of creating joy for yourself, um, whether it be um, at home or, or a little bit outside your home, you know, especially with the weather being, being nice to, to take time for some joy for yourself. <laughs> really important. 
And it, and it certainly it certainly is a lot easier doing this now than it was in April, where it was yes. COVID nineteen and it was April in Massachusetts, which is right. never pretty, right? Right. Everybody's exactly. depressed then anyway, right? Right. Right. Waiting for spring and warm yes. weather. Yeah. Yes. So it has been a really beautiful uh, several weeks. I hope that people are taking that time for some fresh air, even to just feel the sun on your face. There's that you know sense of just being still and feeling the sun and and being in that mindful spot of just experiencing nature that, that the world is still kind of going on, you know, going forward. <laughs> the world is still going. They're going yeah. Right. And, and that notion of, of, of yeah. I suppose that notion too, for seniors, especially of talking to your kids mm -hmm. and not feeling like you're a, like you're a burden. Mm -hmm. Right. That, yeah, I, I think that no. sometimes we don't realize, I, I think maybe um, I know I have an elderly mom and we've been, I have been seeing her during this time because she's been needing help getting to medical appointments. But, um, you know, I think that the impact that you have as a senior in terms of the experiences that you've had on, um, on, on your loved ones, you know, again, it's just what we might need to hear. And, and, you know, if anyone can get through this, it's you because you've got a mentality of, you know, uh, having faced adversity of different types. Um, you know, none of us have faced this particular type, but you've you've faced, <laughs> in all likelihood, a lot more than than uh, the folks that uh, are around you. So, so, and and also there are a good number of of grandparents who are raising grandkids or helping care for grandkids, and um, we invite people to give themselves grace over that because that is a big role that people have had to take on with with being either an educator or a caregiver while their grandchild's, you know, their kids are off as essential workers. So there's just a lot of um, added stresses and worries right now. Yeah. Can I ask a question, Arthur? Of Michelle, course. I was just I encourage interested to, give to know grace. What, what your background is and what is your training, Michelle? What kind of experience mm -hmm. do you bring yes. to? Thank you. So um, I'm a licensed mental health counselor um, and a an, uh, Reiki practitioner, which is a form of energy healing. Um, my professional background is working in child welfare uh, with youth and families for 20 plus years. Um, but I've also been a lifelong student of yoga and of uh, energy healing and body work and meditation. And um, so I, I always dreamt of, of in my 20s when I kind of all these things started coming together of having a place in a space where people could come for all of these modalities of experienced acupuncture uh, in my thirties with dealing with some health issues. So this vision of having this place and space that really creates a community for people to come uh, became a reality. And it's just been a, such a gift, such a gift. Um, and we have just a wonderful, wonderful team of, of people and staff and practitioners and a community that has, I'm so grateful, has stuck by us through this time. So we're grateful. And do you also work with uh, senior centers, Michelle, in the area? Um, we do. We're working with some senior residences as well. Um, we've done some, you know, some of this was actually kicking off too, just as this whole thing went down. But um, yes, yeah, so we've been a resource to um, some local residences and, um, you know, working on connecting with some different housing authorities, our teachers. Um, we've hosted classes affiliated with senior centers and, and several, two of our teachers teach at about 10 or 12 senior centers between the two of them. So, so there's that. We have a range of services for seniors that um, can go out into the community, into their home um, to provide companionship and, um, and company, as well as, you know, in-home yoga and uh, acupuncture and for pain management. And so... And by the way, when things start opening up, they're they're right in they're right in Hudson and lively Hudson, yeah. practically next door. And by yeah. the way, certainly Michelle, we'll you know we'll we'll ask our, our producer, this wonderful guy named Dana Vogue, if you can send him your kind of contact information so can mm -hmm. people can really outreach outreach to you and kind of talk to you about. It. Yes, one, of the, you. one of the reasons why I really appreciated your coming is I know that we had talked about um, the role that that meditation may play in all of this, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, and as I, we've talked about before, you know, I'm one of those old guys, you know, that you'd hear meditation, you'd be <laughs> like, that those saffron guys with the bald heads at the airport, <laughs> I remember this from like the 70s, right? Yeah. But yeah. it's really kind of become so much more than that. And and I, I really want, I was hoping you could talk a little bit about mm -hmm. that, because mm -hmm. I'm personally, you know, a, I'm, I'm a kind of an adherent, you know, I really mm -hmm. think it's terrific, it's terrific yeah. what you can, what you're doing and the role this can play in seniors' lives. Sure, so um, 
One of the most powerful things that we can all access that is so easy is our breath. And um, many times when, when we're feeling, uh, when we're emotions in our head is taking us to these uh, spaces of anxiety or sadness or, you know, all the range of emotions that we're coming up with, there's a lot going on in the world right now. Um, if we come back to our breath, it can really slow down our nervous system and um, just put us on a, on, a, on a better track physically and mentally. So um, I would be happy to share with you this four count breath, which is um, a very simple uh, technique that you can uh, do with us here today uh, to try it out. And then also, you know, just access it any time where you're feeling, you know, I, like I need to take a breath, <laughs> which does come up. So would it be all right if we give that a try? Sounds great. Try. Are you willing to join us? Okay. Let's try. All right. So what I'm going to ask everyone to do is to find, you know, a comfortable spot in your seat. And what we're going to do is close our eyes. And I'm going to take you through a four count breath where we're going to breathe in for four. We're going to hold it for four. And then we're going to exhale for four. And if for some reason you're unable to hold for four breaths, that's okay. Um, you know, hold for what you feel comfortable with, okay? All right, so we're gonna do this three times and I'd like you to just sort of take note of how you're feeling right now and then see how you feel after, okay? All right, so here we are. Everyone close your eyes. All right, inhale, one, two, three, four. Hold, two, three, four. Exhale, two, three, four. Inhale, two, three, four. Hold, two, three, four. Exhale, two, three, four. Inhale, two, three, four. Hold, two, three, four. Exhale, two, three, and four. So I invite you to open your eyes and how do you feel just taking that little opportunity to breathe? It's wonderful. It's a little great. better? <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's just wonderful. I remember, and, and I find myself doing this because I had, I had, I got introduced to Michelle um, because she was a, a guest um, on, my, on my show in Westboro because she lives in Westboro. And we went, we, she did the show and then she did the breath. And I was like, well, we need, we need her every place, <laughs> right? And I want to know, Michelle, I mean, it's a tribute to, it's not everybody for whom I'll shut my eyes while I'm hosting a TV show. <laughs> Thank you. I kind of, appreciate that. <laughs> so Michelle, you know, we really appreciate your coming on. This mm -hmm. is just a, you know, it's a wonderful, it's, I think it's a gift to a lot of people. I think it's a way for, for people to stop thinking about all this, you know, there's a lot going on, but there's mm -hmm. a lot that's still wonderful. And the breath mm -hmm. is a wonderful way to start, you know? Yes, and so, you know, and we hope that people will reach out to you and to, and to mm -hmm. you know, your colleagues, if, if, if this all happens. I also want to mention that this is, um, for folks who've been watching this through, the, through COVID-19 and from before, this is Chris Lindquist's last show because Chris um, has, is leaving the Northrow uh, Public Library job because he found another one. He's been commuting from central Connecticut for years. He now has a job in Farmington, Connecticut, 15 minutes from his house, the library there. So he's a happy guy. Not that he hasn't loved Northrow, but Chris, I just want to thank you, you know, and I, I know that you've, 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 you've always said you've enjoyed your Northrow time. I have. It's gone, it's gone by too quickly, Arthur. Five years has gone by in the blink of an eye, but I have enjoyed my time here and I'm not going to be a stranger. I promise I'm going to come back. Hopefully you'll have me on your show uh, sometime in the future. I know Liz Tridiak is going to be your new co-host. So congratulations yeah. to Liz. And I'm, I'm going to be watching. And, um, and, and I really appreciate, you know, you're your, uh, giving me the opportunity to be co-host. I'm, I'm going to keep my day job. I'm still going to be a library director, but yeah. I've enjoyed that's, it immensely. But we've had some good times. And we get to meet people like Michelle Grasso, which has been pretty wonderful, right? This, is, this has all been good. So folks, Thank folks, you. we will be um, um, starting uh, I'll, my, once my wonderful new co-host, Liz Tridiak, your new um, senior center and council and aging director uh, in two weeks from now. And we'll, we'll be making these shows every two weeks now that things are kind of opening up a little bit. And so that the world isn't changing at such a rapid pace. 
Um, thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Chris, thank you. always. You're thank welcome. you both. Uh, and folks, we'll look forward to seeing you uh, and Liz Tridiak on the next installment of Frank and Mary here in Northrow, the COVID-19 edition. Thank you very much. <laughs>